Yeah, um, the Weather and Climate Dynamics Group at NOAA GFDL. Um, his main interests are advanced numerical methods for weather and climate modeling and improvements of hurricane long-term simulations and predictions via the ultra-high-resolution global cloud-resolving approach. He has developed various versions of the finite volume dynamical core that are adopted in major modeling centers in the U.S., NASA, NCAR, GFDL, Germany, China, Taiwan, and South Korea. Recently, he has developed a global non-hydrostatic cloud resolving model and is, active and is actively testing the applicability of such an approach for a seasonal prediction of landfall hurricanes and tornado outbreak events. And in 2011, he won the Noah Gold Medal Award for his contributions to GFDL's hurricane research. And in 2013, he won NOAA, the NOAA Administrator's Award for dramatic improvements in atmospheric models leading to major scientific events, especially in the simulation of tropical storm activity. So we're honored to have SJ here. And just for the record, we're also, um, this presentation is going out uh, remotely. So the way that this will work is SJ will give his talk. We'll take questions from the audience. And then at the end, after everyone in attendance has asked their questions, we'll then take questions from the remote people who are remotely attending. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rory, for the uh, nice introduction. <clears throat> and uh, I'm honored to be here. And uh, because this will be uh, broadcasted, so uh, I won't have a pointer, so I have to use the mouse. And uh, so, so please excuse me. I have to probably the best way for me to do this is I sit here. Nah, nah, don't take any offenses. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can talk to the phone. <laughs> Okay, I'm trying to learn the new technology here. <laughs> um, so, um, so uh, let's uh, uh, begin uh, my presentation uh, by saying that uh, um, the dynamic core itself is, is just uh, part of the modeling system. It's not a model by itself. However, it has broad uh, implications to uh, different kind of modeling. Uh, weather prediction, short-term weather prediction, even uh, uh, um, local thunderstorm prediction, hurricane prediction, seasonal prediction, and all the way to the cable prediction or climate IPCC type uh, climate simulation. And indeed, we have used this uh, uh, dynamical core framework for the uh, application I just mentioned. So it's indeed has been tested in really uh, different, very different spatial and very di different uh, temporal. So as you can see, um, uh, uh, just uh, the two example here on the left, red left, on the right here. Um, this is the uh, example of using the uh, every three dynamical core at the uh, GFD or IPCC uh, uh, class. We call it IPCC class climate modeling system, which has uh, chemistry and also very complicated uh, CIs, ocean land service component. And uh, pretty much the one of, you can call it the Earth system model. So that's one uh, uh, application. The other extreme, you can do that for a few hours, is we can really zoom in the solution from this modeling system that allow you to actually, uh, for the first time, I would, I believe for the first time in modeling history, it's a global model simulating hurricane, uh, hurricane, 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 not me, <laughs> tornadoes. <laughs> so uh, global model, global, Model developed for climate application for the first time, capable of simulating tornadoes. Not, not many uh, regional models uh, can, can claim that either. So uh, let me uh, uh, say something that uh, uh, about the GFDL. Um, GFDL was founded on, on the premise of the NRP, in fact. I would say that uh, numeric, NRP stands for numerical weather prediction. It's in the GFD of DNA. And uh, in 1995, now this is the document that uh, I, I was uh, mass wise, mass three years old, minus three. Um, <laughs> that document uh, gave the uh, rationale of uh, establishing GFD, uh, uh, predominantly a climate modeling center. The basis is based on the success of the first NWP experiment ever done in the world. That time in Princeton earlier, after immediately after World War II, 
Well, the, uh, this is a historical document. Actually, as I believe it's Joseph Makarinsky's uh, handwriting. And uh, it stated some of the major findings that it's actually possible to do weather forecast 24 hours in advance. That's a major achievement, right? <laughs> so we take it for granted now. Um, and then the effect of mountain and the Brazilian are not that important. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you see that uh, how this getting started, you started from a very simple idealized system. You gradually go more complex and your capability go, your knowledge and understanding match your uh, computing resources. That's how uh, the science of modeling weather and climate advance. So the first successful NRV set foundation for the GFDL. And uh, it's a print, uh, actually, we, as I already mentioned, that uh, we, we have DNA, we have NRV DNA in, in our, our day. And 60 years later, <coughs> I see that uh, weather and climate modeling has a great opportunity of uh, unification. What Dr. Suka has been uh, promoting is a seamless modeling system. And I, I believe this is feasible today. Uh, although if we want to do it uh, really the right way, uh, a lot of uh, planning and resources has to be uh, 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 required. So let me cut to the chat. <coughs> um, uh, about two years ago, that uh, um, the Nature Weather Service based on me, urgent me, that uh, U.S. weather prediction capability has uh, falling further behind. Not only behind, the gap is not closing, but actually increasing the gap, falling far more behind than, than, the, than the European centers, mostly the Asian WF and uh, UKMO. So they started this project called Next Generation Global Prediction System. Well, as I mentioned, Diamond itself is not a modeling system, but it's really the foundation of all the modeling systems. So that's where you start. But it's not an end, I have to emphasize. And uh, at the time, they were trying to uh, pick the best, choose the five animal, and uh, put it in the cage to see uh, which one come out alive, basically. <laughs> all you can think about this is the gladiator fight. It's not like we all a group collaborating together, rather it's like a competition. But uh, whether I like it or not, that's the way you were set up. So, um, um, so after the f there are two phases. So after phase one and phase two, and they have uh, set up different uh, idea situation as well as a very challenging global cloud resolving simulation and do some preliminary comparison. But phase two is a little bit uh, tougher in the sense that uh, you have to actually not just do the idealized test, but also compare it to uh, real weather forecasting. You have to compare it to the operational forecast to see how well you do. And uh, out of the five, uh, out of five dynamic call, I started with GFD every three. It's a finite volume on the cube sphere. That's why it's called uh, every three. Three means actually cubic. Uh, NCAR, n it, um, it, it is in my judgment, more, more a finite different model than the finite volume. Also, people call it the finite volume model. It's not really a finite volume model, and I will go to that uh, in the next slide. Uh, and there's the N7, N3, Navy, and uh, ESIL, so I won't go into that. So that's what, what happened. Uh, earlier this year, we uh, submitted the uh, forecast data for the uh, evaluation, and the other side also had to, because it's done to only two models, the other side also had to submit it, had to submit the data set for evaluation. <clears throat> By June, that uh, the DTG, what's called DTG, is a dynamical core test group, like the recommendation to the UMAC committee uh, for the selection of the three for NGGPS. So the rule about it, before that was that uh, we, we, we each group should not think the, uh, think the model, you have to use as is. And after the selection sort of become final, we actually started tuning because you know that the dynamic core is not a true model. You, 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 want to get a, you want to get the best result out of a, a modeling system. All the components have to work together in sync. And uh, you can tune the dynamic to fit the physics or you can tune the physics to fit the dynamic and you can tune both gradually, and, and, and the, this is the art form, actually, tuning the model, not just for uh, climate modeling system, but also for weather prediction. 
the approach we are using is really uh, surprising to some of the weather uh, prediction folks. We tune in like a climate model. And actually, I want to see how how this works in a weather prediction uh, model. That you try to tune to get rid of major fire instead of a specific event and try to tune some, some specific event failure such as Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, and you can certainly tune fix your conversion scheme to make it better, sure, but that's one event. We don't want to do that. We want to do it, do it from, from what we know the best, climate model. And, and we try to change the global bands, look at the global statistics, how much water in the air, how much snow suspended in the atmosphere, how much rain water, how much cold water, what's the mean 500 meter bar height, annually, if there's a bias, positive or negative, it's fixable. Very easily fixable. But you are only tuning the mean bias. So, so now it, it really uh, helps a lot. And we also uh, started upgrading the physics. Instead of the GFS physics as it, we started uh, changing it piece by piece. Now today I'm going to show you the change to the car micro physics, which is actually a very important ingredient for the uh, weather prediction system as we go resolution higher and higher resolution. So today, November uh, 2016, <coughs> I want to uh, state that GFS has built uh, every three best NGGPS prototype model without a data simulation system that already uh, significantly outperformed the operational forecast model of the GFS. I will show you the results. The instant statement of the 74 cases at the bottom of the slide. We also do more than that. We also do two years. Yes, yes. It's statistical significance. I see, I'll show you the statistical significance. Um, and also we have been working with EC and WF, and they are curious of what we are doing. So they send us their initial condition, and we do basically very simple straightforward interpolation, vertically, horizontally. And because we, we, we don't have that model, that model, so we have to use the GSS that model. SST is still frozen in time. And there are other kind of handicaps I don't want to mention, but I will show you the, the difference. So uh, I, I mentioned what the finite volume, I criticize other call they claim to be finite volume, but uh, I say they are not. Uh, and then what's finite volume about every three? Okay. Um, this is 20 years of uh, research and development in one single slide. So I uh, try to break it down to five items the best I could. And uh, that's basically I want to start with how we uh, view the atmosphere in the discrete space. We want to view it in a control volume space to maintain conservation. And because of the Lagrangian uh, visualization gives us lots of computational advantage, not just scientific advantage. Computational advantage, I can go on for 30 minutes, but I don't think I have the time. But basically, it, it helps the parallelization quite significantly also help to reduce the memory utilization that we can fit the small fast memory memory as cache and also cache much better than other approximations. So that's why this type of call has much more complicated algorithm. But it actually runs much faster than others. That, that's something some reason for this. Okay? And, and so that's the vertical uh, Lagrangian uh, visualization. Then I will go on to the next few slides to illustrate more about how we use the first principle to develop the dynamic core. Instead of trying to look at the dynamic core as solving the equation set, which is mathematically based, what we try to accomplish is a physically based model that we based on first principle. We do not based on uh, continuous partial differential equation. Rather, we look at conservation law, first principle, in a dis discretized control volume space. So everything is discretized at the beginning. We did not really begin as a continuous equation. That's the fundamental difference. And it's a fundamental philosophical difference. They have to, have to convince the other guy <laughs> that this is the right way or not. The best way to convince people is you put up better results. So that's our approach. And the, uh, the second item is the physical depends for working in time horizontal transport. Now, this is important also uh, not just for accuracy reason, but also for computational reason. For example, transport, you think about uh, uh, a of of uh, uh, car water from this place to this place. Basically, you move car water, assuming there's no uh, other process, it's just dynamic. You just move that from this place to that place. And think about it, it's based on characteristics. 
space and time discrimination is not separable. That's the difference. And I believe this is actually the hallmark of the, of the two final volume scheme. And it is two time level. Some more always use uh, three time level, even four time level, like RK3, RK4. That by itself is okay, but it's solving the equation, not solving the physical problem. And there's a difference here. Usually you know physical consistency, unless you are extremely careful. But if you start with the physical uh, base visualization, you have a very good guide on how to do it correctly. And that's what we accomplished. Number three, there's lots of uh, uh, controversial even uh, uh, debate about the uh, degree. I, I think they are kind of too shallow minded. Degree uh, um, is just like, some people say, oh, your dynamic is not based on C degree because particularly the town modern community, they think C degree is the best. If you are not C degree, this model is useless, essentially. That's what they say. Okay? It's worse than judging a book by color. Okay? It's worse than judging a book by its color. There's a lot more to, to the, the degree staggering. Also, there's a lot more about linear versus nonlinear analysis. And what they were basing on just linear analysis in one dimension or two dimensions. And I would hope I can convince you that this is not the whole story. Uh, number four, what we uh, use quite uniquely, and this method actually borrowed from the uh, aerospace engineering. I was studying aerospace engineering well before I uh, jumped ship to um, geology. Uh, this there's a lot of similarity between the design of aircraft wind and how you deal with terrain volume coordinates. I will give you a decision. So it's using a finite volume concept to deal with how do you deal with the terrain volume coordinates that we all have to use because the, the Earth has ocean, you have mountains, the surface is not flat. And for long hydrostatic extension, because we use the vertical Lagrangian visualization, it reduces the sunway problem into 1D. This is another, yet another advantage of using Lagrangian visualization. I, I have to apologize that I only uh, touch the surface because each item, uh, I give you a few references here, but each item uh, is a one hour presentation. So if I say this is 20 years of uh, research and development in one slide, this is the best I can do today. But let me give you some very simple, easy to understand uh, uh, illustration. I hope you can get the, the basic concept of it. So this is uh, what's uh, controversial in, the, in some of the uh, uh, how modern communities, they, they think that there's only one grid. They said you have to use C grid staggering. Otherwise, your, your model is not good. However, I, I'd like to point out just three major things here. If you do a linearized equation, shallow water equation, that's what they do. And I did that uh, in the 1970. And you look, look at the dispersion uh, relationship. Certainly, you can argue from that perspective, sequence is the best. But there are other things involved, more than just the linear dispersion relationship. So I like to look at this kind of schematically, of kind of uh, geometrically, relate the physical uh, uh, problem to something like a visible. Essentially, uh, if you are doing in the method, the best average you do, the more accurate algorithm is. So you look at this uh, diagram here, that actually the, the hollow error means that it's frequently win, and the solid error is surrounding the finite volume. Uh, I'm not sure how you can see my <laughs> finger. <laughs> All right. and, and this is really uh, uh, the, what's the core degree. And as you can see, C degree is certainly good for diverging computation. And D degree is actually uh, the best degree for uh, uh, saturation. And by stock theorem, saturation divided by volume area give you the average statistic. So C degree is best for diverging control. D degree is best for statistic control. There's no such thing as which one is best. It's like water and fire. Is water better than fire? I don't know. But they are totally different. But how do you combine them together? So what we can do is make the opposite thing work together. Take the advantage of both. So again, let me uh, uh, review it. Pressure gradient, you, you look at the least averaging principle, which makes switch staggering provide you the least amount of energy is the best. So C is the best possible grid for pressure gradient only. D 
pay grade require more averaging, it's actually the worst possible grade for pressure gradient computation. But this is under the assumption of everything being equal. I want to say that everything is not equal because we use finite difference versus finite volume. We can do a lot better than that, than finite difference. And for example, the best computation of dynamic using aircraft engineering or rocket science, science nobody uses squeeze triggering anyway. So that's just a side story. But you can handle the weakness of a particular squeeze triggering by data and memory system. The key is to keep the best attribute and and try to minimize the, the weak part. Keep your strength, minimize your weakness. Okay, but given everything being equal, they are just total opposite. The autopic balance, <coughs> C grid is absolutely the worst possible grid. Have you ever seen a, a C grid model really run primary model well? I doubt it. Really, it has something to do with this geotropic balance. It requires the most amount of average. C grid has no average required, it's the best. And this is our linear aspect. I know this is the NLP uh, class 101 that, that the people will teach. But the people in teaching the class, I also taught the class once myself. <laughs> Forget about the linear aspect. Linear aspect is what Arakawa type analysis failed to tell you the story. It is just painting the story partially. Now, sequence is the worst possible grid for vertistic and holistic. What's holistic? Holistic is the product of the vertical velocity and vertistic. So in strong prediction community, you look at abstract velocity to predict when this supercell thunderstorm may or may not produce tornado. And it is very important, but it's not linear. It's impossible to analyze using uh, Arakawa type linear analysis. But big grid turned out to be the best possible grid as well for the linear aspect. So you see the story. Uh, my, my point is, I heard a lot of criticism from NCAR. Oh, this, this model is not based on C grid, so it's garbage for convection scale. I say, well, that's your opinion. <laughs> you have to think a little bit deeper. <laughs> Other than just following uh, some kind of analysis that the method developed 30, 40 years ago, uh, situation has changed. You have to uh, realize that uh, it is not a uh, second order finite difference pool anymore. So, <clears throat> uh, I want to use this diagram to, to describe how we deal with the pressure gradient. So this is really the, uh, the method actually uh, was inspired by the, uh, the design of the aircraft wing. And here I, I show the cross section of the wing here. So this is the two-dimensional cross section. You see, uh, when the aircraft is flying, it has resistance. It, has, it also has to overcome its weight. So the lift force, if this is the increasing altitude, the lift force balances the weight. And the, 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 the thrust from the engine balances the the form check. But in the atmosphere model, what you need is this form check. Form check is actually horizontal acceleration, PUDT. And uh, the lift force in hydrostatic uh, model actually balances the weight. So what you do in, in current following coordinate this Lagrangian uh, discretization is you integrate the pressure gradient force around your grid cell. Assuming this is a grid cell, and you obtain the resultant force, that's a vector. And the vector has two components in this two-dimensional cross-section. The vertical component balance is vectorly the weight, which is a hydrostatic approximation. And the horizontal projection of that vector force actually is your, the, the term you want, the your du dt equation. But we look at this in the discrete space. So there's no uh, two-term controversy. It's just one single term. So uh, on the other hand, the energy I always give to people is hydrostatic is like uh, uh, a passenger jet flying at cruising altitude. 10 kilometer high, cruising, no vertical acceleration, unless you hit turbulence. <laughs> and that hydrostatic model is much more nimble. It's what's required for the next generation weather prediction. It's like a fighter jet. It can accelerate the earth very quickly. And that's what's required for the, uh, for the uh, storm scale prediction. So. Uh, the G-force is zero in hydrostatic because it is the lift force exactly balances the, uh, the weight. But in the hydrostatic, it is not zero. Is, are you even driving a Tesla? It's, it was, <laughs> it's like this. G-force is very strong. It's, it's like this. Are you using uh, driving a school bus or you are driving a Tesla sports car? It's, it's, that's different. <laughs> 
between hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic model. So here, here's it again. So that's a hydrostatic model. This is a question just said, oh, it's grinding. It's grinding. There's no vertical acceleration, but it's grinding with the flow. That's a hydrostatic model <laughs> because PWTT is zero. The lift force bends with. Now, the hydrostatic model, I use this S22 uh, raptor example. It can accelerate very quickly, going down up any way you want. And you can also cruise, of course, if you chose to. And they have a huge G force. That's the difference. So how you do that in the model? models? Basically, this is the cross section of every three vertical cross section. So your your regular space uh, is rising in the x x and z direction. So this is a mountain, and the mountain surface is actually a Lagrangian surface. And the model surface is technically, but the idea is not not a Lagrangian surface. But you have to assume something at the top because you have to keep a finite top. So by finite type, I have to assume it has constant pressure like every single other model, but it also is a Lagrangian surface. The advantage is it, it, it actually minimizes the wave reflection because the Lagrangian surface can, can kind of, like you putting a plastic on your swimming pool. If you can allow wave to propagate, but the mass does not penetrate, so it's conservative, mass conservative. Now, <laughs> So that's the Lagrangian surface. Now looking at this Lagrangian control volume, as I already explained, like aircraft wind, you integrate the pressure forces from four side, and then you come up the redundant force. And turn out that CUDT is really the G force for divided by the angle of tension. And the, the vertical depends on the hydrostatic or non-hydrostatic. As I already mentioned, if it's hydrostatic, the vertical net force, you integrate the P around the volume using green theorem, and you, if you're interested, you please read my uh, paper, 1997 Quarter Journal. Uh, there you can uh, find the details. But the the idea is very very simple. And uh, and, and and by doing this, also you realize that this is the automatic satisfy Newton's third law. You will be amazed. Most numerical model does not satisfy Newton's second law third law. <laughs> Amazing. But this does. Because we start a Newton's second law from, from the decreased state, F equals N A. And how, how, how does this satisfy the Newton, Newton's third law, action equal to reaction? Because you look at the pressure gradient forces, they cancel each other. The force acting on this phase cancel the other side. You integrate along the whole sphere, they are zero. The only thing remains is the top and bottom, top is zero. But bottom is the mountain top. So, so this, this this is kind of conservation in a conservation in a sense that the really other model achieve and really uh, um, uh, people do not understand and then the, some people actually criticize this as uh, not conserving angular momentum. Yes, it, it doesn't conserve angular momentum, but who does? Uh, not, not exactly. So now everything is perfect. In numerical model, it's about the art of compromise, which which method gives you the least amount of compromise. And overall, uh, because nobody is that, it's just who produces this amount of error. So, um, linear waves. What what people were looking at only the dis dispersion direction. The, the best way is just putting the real mountain, very tricky mountain in this case, and, and, and compared to uh, so this is totally linear situation. And this is done in NGGB space one in the comparison. Here we have five models here, and uh, one uh, linear exact solution right here. And the uh, NPAS indeed is the second best, second best model. All the other models seem to have big problems one way or another. But if you look carefully at NPAS here, this every three, it looks almost like a linear relaxed solution. So people are worried about uh, degree staking, C degree, D degree. D degree is supposed to do the best possible situation for mountain wave because it's purely gravity wave, gravity wave driven wave. But it's not. You look at it because visualization is not just horizontal. It, it's Two dimension, two dimension in the sense that it's X and Z, and how 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 do you do the vertical part also impact your way. It is not just like uh, you choose the sequence that will automatically give you the best possible model. That's kind of make the models like too easy. If if if, if choosing the grid and will say you are you are automatically better, you wouldn't be doing this a lot. Um, so look at this uh, area. It has some uh, wiggle in here, right? Compared to the uh, analysis, it does. It, 
this model produces some severe noises, as you can see in me. So this after that was like in today this day. This after thirty minutes. And this is every three. They away from the leading edge of the wave propagation, they look very, very similar, almost identical. But look carefully here. Now remember in this test you have specified mountain and you specify constant wind flowing from west to east. And the noise actually was going away, going away from the domain. So in the previous stage, you say, the noise falling is not that bad. But this is showing up. But this wasn't shown unless you are looking at the result carefully. But it will be shown what happens if you don't have wind. Wind is meaning it's zero. Like in global model, there's no place to hide in the global model. In the regional model, people who develop regional model, they probably didn't pay much attention as global model to about more noise information. But regional model, they really pay attention to, to the noise uh, propagation because it, it propagates out of their domain anyway. But so this is a kind of very good demonstration. What we call the uh, hydrostatic equipment test. Basically, it initialize the global, this is a global model now. Initialize the global model with very rough terrain and, and no wind. So any wind produced are errors. And, you, and they don't propagate because the mean wind is zero. So in case of impact, you see the noise keeps accumulating, going by a pipe. In every city, let's say this is very reasonable because there's there some area associated with it. This is exactly reflecting the shape of the mountain. But it does not produce all kinds of strange noises here. And this has some consequences for not just for weather prediction, it is a global model. Because the regional model may not be measured that much because in the, 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 in the regional model, the mesoscale scale information will help together by your boundary condition. So they don't, they probably don't have to worry about the, the, the quality of their meso scale or synoptic scale because it was provided by the boundary condition. But once you are global model, you have to, you have to uh, take care of everything <laughs> yourself. So, and that's not the case with NPAS. And so that's uh, mostly linear aspect. The linear aspect, some, one of the things that uh, we can compare is, is the kinetic energy spectrum, this well established turbulence theory how it should look like. So you have the mass three here, mass three uh, synoptic scale spectrum, you can call it, and there's mass five per spectrum, mesoscale spectrum. And because we are running this at 13 kilometer resolution, that, that's where you should look. So the blue curve is the every three uh, forecast using the GFS. Everything is the same. Uh, NPAS also using GFS physics. Um, so you can see that the Big gap between the ABC. ABC, by the way, uh, match the observational slope. That's mass right there. As well as you know, it's also proven by theory. Almost exactly until two, 4 delta x. But uh, in the NGG previous report, you read it, it, it stated that uh, MPAS produced as well uh, energy spectrum as the ABC. But what it is, they counted the noises uh, here. There's a lot of noises. And not only that, uh, they don't really match mass vice versa. So you, you measure the slope from the top of the noise and to here, then indeed you get the mass vice versa. And I'll show you the, the source of the noise here. So this is uh, from there, from Haika. Almost in every case we submitted, there are 74 cases. 74 cases. Whenever the, the, the jet stream is strong, you see this fish, fish scale, we call it fish scale noises. This is 200 millibar wind speed. And this is exactly for delta x, and this is what it is. So this for delta x from, from this particular model uh, kind of uh, produces a force, mesoscale spectrum. And this is not just in entire IPD, it's also in eta eta the wolf. So the forecast scale. Um, so uh, both groups submitted uh, 74 cases. Uh, using uh, initial conditions from uh, operational model. In the physical physical periodization, that model is uh, identical. We make sure they are identical. Nobody can uh, allow to team. So we, we look at, the uh, first thing you look at, the 500 minibar high correlation, anomaly correlation for the whole year. This is uh, one day, five day uh, interval. So uh, the, the green, the, I'm sorry, the green and black are the, Every three and GFS, so every three basically match GFS almost uh, identically. 
very, very similar. And M plus basically is a drop out every single case, except a few. And, and, and you look at the, the statistic, uh, the, what the uh, decay, what's called die off from zero day to 10 day, there's a significant gap. And the green, so even every three is slightly uh, worse than GFS in this setup because we are not allowed to change anything. And there's just mismatch between dynamic and physics. But what happens if we started to tune it? Of course, I already say we can easily beat the GFS. Uh, quick question, is GFS is at spectral level? Yeah, still. But however, they change the dynamic. It's basically, in essence, still a spectral model, but the version, they change it to the, uh, a semi semi impression semi Lagrangian, just a version part. So it's exactly the same as the ECMW IFS. They are identical, essentially. Yeah. Is there like T5 76? No, they are equivalent to uh, 13 kilometers. The solution okay, by the same. 13 kilometers, T1500 oh, okay. something. Yeah, like yeah, of course, it's not just to the uh, 500 millibar high or normal correlation. You have to look at uh, simulation, precipitation, hurricane, and uh, score line, whatever you can find out. So this is just to show one of the, uh, one or two examples of the mean precipitation out of those 74 cases and team physics, identical physics, just changing the uh, dynamical core. So on here, it's the every three uh, annual mean precipitation out of the 74 cases, so you, you have annual mean. You can produce the annual mean. So this is the precipitation over the South America, and this is the trend. And uh, you, you can see the, and this is GFS, you can see the IMS and correlation. It's much, much smaller than the uh, GFS operation, or this operational model in the middle. Even though the ACC in this particular situation is slightly worse than GFS, but you can see there are a lot of things that, that this is so, uh, one of the reasons why you really don't want to use the spectral model in very high resolution. You can see the uh, spectral gips oxidation almost anywhere. Um, uh, if you do a timing average of the CFS forecast, you see gifts of station almost everywhere over terrain. So this is over South America, this is over uh, South Asia, it's the same thing. And you look at the correlation and looping square error, everything uh, is much smaller than the CFS. Until. So we try to, people start asking us the cut up question. Now, uh, why don't you unify the regional model with the global model? Yes, we say we could, and we are trying to do that. But the first thing is, we want to do things uh, step by step. First, we want to uh, improve the GFS thesis piece by piece. Instead of uh, wholesale using the GFD or modern system, which is entirely different. Uh, I don't think they will accept that. So, um, we, the first step we try to do is replace their car microphysics with the GFD or cow microphysics, which is six category. It just, this cow microphysics is very similar to traditional use in uh, Wolf. However, I believe it's a little bit more consistent thermodynamically. Uh, this some of the major thing here. So this GFD or microphysics was designed for seasonal prediction. We published a paper in 2011 for seasonal hurricane prediction, and also used for climate simulation. That's no surprise to anybody <laughs> if they are doing climate simulation. Um, but it's tuned for global bears, in particular radiative bears. You would be surprised if we take air, uh, off carmichael physics or any other is carmichael and put in a global model, and you see the top of the top of the energy bears was off by 31. That was what a shock that is to me. But anyway, we, we did think that uh, um, to, to balance it, there is some slight benefit. And we developed the car microphysics based on first principle, paying very extreme attention to details about how consistent the formulation is thermodynamically. For example, I just give you one example here, just too many little details. For example, we also consider the heat content in the condensate. This is totally ignored by everybody else. So, so when 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 you have grid box control volume like this in the grid box atmosphere, if you hit this box by radiation or whatever. It not only hit the dry air. All the other models assume it's dry air. We hit not only the dry air, we hit water vapor, hit or cool the water vapor. And in addition, cow water, cow ice. And you may, the, the heat capacity of cow water is four times or larger than the heat capacity of dry air. 
And they actually make some uh, non-trivial difference when you are in the cloudy atmosphere. So this is the detail we, we pay to, attention to detail. And we write in a very computational efficient way. So digital car microwave is very slow because the condensate flow is very fast speed. And that requires the use of very small time step. We solve this by two methods. One method is by the one gen control volume method. Is that data famous? I recall. But that one is also expensive. So I, I recently come up with the time increased solver to solve the uh, flow of the condensate. KL or, or, or raindrop, dust raindrop, they flow very quickly. Normally they would require very use of very small time step, but we, we, we handle that. And last thing I want to mention is uh, you look at the computation. That's exactly what each and other has been doing. Although their chemical physics is much simpler, I just realized this recently. I, because I start after NTGP, I started to to study each and other model. And here's what I found. So here is the TFD or chemical physics uh, kind of schem schematic diagram showing how each species interacts. And this is what each and other model is. Incredibly simple. Probably too simple. But uh, um, uh, I think we can do a lot better than them. But also, uh, more complication doesn't mean it's better. I have done this hard lesson. But uh, I believe this is for car microphones, for car resolving. This is sort of an essential piece. And I also look at the UK mail, which is the car microphones. They are a little bit more sophisticated than the Asian area. I believe they probably have some application requirement. They, they, they probably the reason. But the Asian area model is very simple and very effective, I would say. Simple and effective, a thing of beauty. Okay, uh, <clears throat> first step, the world regional global unification, as I already mentioned, you want to have a, 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 a physics package, not just a dynamical, yes, we can go down hydrostatic, we can go very high resolution, but it's just dynamic. You also have to have the corresponding physical dynamic package. So we try to make GFS applicable to all scale. The first step, changing the car micro is that's the most important time, uh, step. And the rule of thumb, do not harm the global prediction while doing it. And, and to our uh, nice surprise, we not only did not harm it, we actually improved the skill of the global prediction when running the same curve at lower resolution. That's the key, running with a physics that's suitable for three or two kilometers, but running it at 13 kilometers and still get better results. So that's the challenge. But uh, here I show you the uh, final minibar uh, normal correlation here. But uh, the, this is easy, easier to tell by showing the difference versus operational GFS. So 0, 9, if you get 0 straight 9, that's operational GFS. Below is worse, above is better. And this 9 here is the true standard deviation. That's the statistical significance. So this green 9 is our latest effort of uh, this is still by not GFS physics, but we just replaced the car micro physics with GFD version and run it with the FE3. And we get a very significant improvement from day two to, to, the, to the end. And, and the, the red curve is the, the, the our best attempt, but we didn't try it that very hard because we know their car micro is not suitable. So we, we, we do some tuning and we were able to match their uh, anomaly correlation with original physics. And this is with our uh, GFD of physics. Now the significance is, is this, if you, you understand the gap between EG and RF and GFS, this is 50% of the gap. So we catch them, cut their lead by half, just changing the physics and the dynamics. And, uh, and you, you also realize that the UK make all this petition is, has been better, systematically better than GFS. This already means all bit EK. EKM uh, prediction without uh, a new data assimilation system. So this is still using GFS IC, incorporated from Gaussian grid to the tip sphere grid. We suffer a lot doing that, but we still managed to uh, get a very good uh, prediction. So interesting question you will ask, how does this compare to EC and WF if you use EC and WF initial condition? I'm also very curious, and so is EC and WF. <laughs> So they send us some uh, initial condition for us to test. So this, oh, not yet. I'm sorry. So this is just showing that uh, we, when we improve the, uh, I'm sorry. So when we improve the uh, uh, the 500 minibar correlation, it's not just 500 minibar correlation. 500 minibar co normal correlation by itself is not prediction. 
you have to look at something more realistic, but something like hurricane, and we did. But I, I don't have time to show you uh, all of this. But this is showing the uh, equitable threat score for precipitation over a continental United States. And again, this is the uh, green one is the GFD of physics with every three. And the zero nine is the operational uh, uh, GFS product. And pretty much we uh, outperform the operational product very significant. And here it's uh, 2%. Here it's uh, close to the weak event. It's close to 0 0.3, 0 0.03. This is very substantial improvement. Not easy to achieve by changing any single model component. So here's the, uh, the, the, the transparent experiment using ECMWS initial condition. So uh, we have, uh, what I have, I'm showing here is 32 cases from the middle of last year, August 14 to, to January 16 this year, every other five day, not every single day, so uh, 32 cases only. And here you just the reference. Here is the GFS operational forecast. This night, the start. And there are two nights here using the uh, FV3 with the modified uh, GFT of physics. And com let's compare to the ECM data forecast. So here, so you ignore the top figure for now. Look at this. Zero nine would be operational GFS forecast. And the red, pay attention to red. This is the operational ECMW forecast. So they are this much better than, than the operational GFS. But when we, we run two versions with different vertical resolution, one with 93, uh, 63, I'm sorry, and 95 there. So these two are using the every 3 with GFD of microphysics. And we act using uh, an atmosphere initial condition from ECMW. But everything else is actually GFS, including that model. It's still GFS. And we actually outperform them in here between four day and, and, and day six. Also, this is may not be that statistical significant, but uh, at least I would say we are, at least that's good. Uh, see, the interesting thing is for the first three to four days, it's totally if you have a good enough model, it's totally determined by initial condition. Doesn't matter what, what, what changes, we change the horizontal resolution, we change the vertical resolution, it doesn't really matter. If you have better initial condition, you get a better result, that's it. Um, so if you use GFS, you are not going to be easier that way. If you use IC from GFS, I bet it here. It's extremely difficult to pick GFS. But 500 millibar high, uh, autonomic correlation, not a whole story. Well, I, I actually want to show you the uh, suitable pressure. Because 500 mm I seems to favor the spectral model. We do a lot better in the suitable pressure. So the gap here, just focus on the gap, the, 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 the rate is the easier and other operational forecast. And these two curves, one is using 63 vertical layer, the other using 95 vertical layer, just show the sensitivity. And uh, keep in mind, easier and other has 137 layers, almost twice as many as we have. But anyway, uh, the, the gap in the sea level is much larger than you saw in the final high. And, and we, we, we are, in, in sea level level, other than this, this is really statistically uncertain. Because at better day, you, you, you need more members. But in the first seven to eight days, I think this statistical significant, we are better using the initial condition. So at least I could I would argue we are already there in terms of modeling. The the question is uh, the data estimation. So this is one of the NCGFS test results. So we took the MV3 with GFS physics unchanged, and we took MPAS, NCA, MPAS, and of course with GFS physics unchanged, no tuning, nobody tuning anything. Run the operational uh, data estimation system, and this is the result. So this is the Lumen square average of a Lumen square error, O mass F average globally, and the break is operational model. So with every three, the only thing changes is dynamic core, nothing else. You actually reduce it fits the operational version in, in data estimation without any uh, tuning, and this is the impact, of course, producing. 
<laughs> way too too large data. So this is the wind, this is the temperature, same story. Although the temperature difference is much smaller, but it is still the same direction. That uh, when you change the dynamical to every three, it actually improves the data simulation system, even before tuning. With tuning, I think we have a golden opportunity to do something really good. Also that, uh, so this leads to my uh, final slide, that, uh, as I said, that uh, an hydrostatic model is like a fighter jet, much more nimble. If you want to go to war, you go with the best weapon. That's what we have. You don't uh, fly World War Three with uh, World War Two aircraft, right? Uh, the hydrostatic model for the model weather prediction, I believe, is times over. Uh, Ooh, that's no really no point. Uh, global original, you don't even that situation. You people have to start consider how to deal with the hydrostatic model because in the data simulation system, there's a lot of something about hydrostatic data. And so even if you have an hydrostatic model, the data simulation doesn't really use it at all. They actually, ignore the vertical motion. So to really get full advantage, we have to go full force not just in modeling, but also data estimation, which is actually more important than modeling, as far as I can tell. And uh, now I want to talk about research to operation and all op op operation back to research. Here's what my view is. The NIP and climate model, they have very different requirements. Climate model require running hundreds of years, and NIP, well, we run short term. So what this does is, uh, it makes the resolution requirement vastly different. So NLP, climate model, you typically want to be able to finish a, a five-year simulation in one day. That's kind of and the metric everybody agrees, even Jim agrees. <laughs> uh, but NLP is different. Uh, they want to make one-day forecast in right now. And they want to finish one-day forecast in eight, eight minutes also. So you translate into super requirement. Climate model, you have to, the super requirement is five years per day. NLE model, super requirement is only half year per day. So naturally, NLE model would be running a much higher resolution than climate model. But we are talking about unification of climate model and weather predictions. There's a mismatching requirement. But let, let me think about this way. Today's NLP model that we develop together can be tomorrow's high resolution climate model. And you have a high resolution climate model, you can have your work course medium resolution model. But if you want to run a paleo climate simulation, study the climate evolution of a million years ago, you use a very low resolution climate model. So, but we can share the same modeling system. So the, my, my goal for, for the next three years, I, I hope the community can work together uh, really people going to the, the area nobody want to go, or they couldn't go, if you have uh, Eastern WA, for example, I believe they are stuck. They are stuck at the hydrostatic for now. Unless they come out something very quick, this is the time to catch them up. Of course, they couldn't do it. Why to take it They couldn't do it. See it. We could. See them this here. It's what I call the gray zone. It's a stuck area of NRP, not left there. Okay, sorry to use that word, but uh, it's a change of that time. Beat them. If you cannot beat them, you lost the community. Because I see that everybody is doing it. Nobody is standing there waiting for you to, to, to catch up. And NRP is like this. Every single particular issue, now, they, they improve very quickly. And if you do not improve faster than them, you'll be left further behind. That's the name of the game. And, and, uh, Lastly, I want to say that uh, I, I, I kind of uh, a fan of uh, General Colin Powell. <laughs> if you want to win a war, you want to win with overwhelming resources, you leave no doubt there. You want to win decisively and not just competitive. We don't want, you don't, you don't in a committee, you don't want to be, it to be fair. You want it to be unfair. You have too much resources on your side. That's how you do it. Thank you for listening, and I would like to answer a question if you have any. Uh, and then Shukla, so you can be 
take into the front end. Okay, yeah, just hold it and when you ask your question. I have a question about tuning. Do you do that systematically and have you thought about using data simulation methods to um, tune, get the best parameters? Yes, uh, we, right now, uh, uh, systematically, yes, we, we try to do it systematically, but uh, everybody has different definition of systematic. <laughs> so we, 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 we try to uh, minimize the, the, the go to the low hanging fruit. You look at some huge bias in, in the GMS. If you look at the uh, outgoing over the engine and incoming solar array, they, you'll be shocked. The incoming solar array was like 10, more than 15, 10 to 15 watt off. That's easily fixable. And the funny thing is, when we first replaced the uh, dynamic core, the first thing we noticed is it's automatic failure. We are very close already without tuning. So there's something strange in the low car from. from Formation with the GLS. But uh, I guess the difference is in the low cup. But we also look at the, uh, the content fair amount. Because we are changing the Carmichael physics, you, you want to look at how much water vapor total in the atmosphere, how much total uh, cow liquid water, how much total snow, how much total rain, how, let me get to that, how much total cow ice in the atmosphere. Uh, the only observation data set we have is cow set which is limited amount of uh, 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 cow ice, and liquid water is kind of doubtful, rain, uh, forget it. So what we look at is actually getting uh, each and every uh, real-time analysis. Assuming they are not a truth, of course, it would be foolish to assume they are a truth. So they do uh, analyze rain water, cow water, cow ice, you know. The only thing they do not have is hair, and we do. So we uh, look at their global mean, some more mean, and look at the distribution difference, and, and look at also cow and whatever data we can get. And they are very different. So we try to stick, stick in between. <laughs> because nobody has uh, observation of rainwater in suspending in the area for any given moment. But each and other time, they may be the only uh, global data set available. And, and right now, we don't tune to them, but uh, we, we take the reference and, and see how much Auto conversion you are allowed to have. So, auto rainwater, uh, cow water to rainwater auto conversion determine largely how much um, rainwater you are going to have. So, things like that. Kind of global average. Strong mean. That's low hanging fruit. And we don't really want to go to event by event thing. I, I think that's for the meso scale model to play. Uh, I, I do not think it helps. Okay. Then as you mentioned, that's a work in progress. That's uh, one of my two bullets that I, I, I hope that we can get our hands on. I think you are absolutely right. You, you, you cannot develop data simulation in isolation. Not, not only that, uh, data simulation, if they have a big model bias, so they cannot do a very good job data getting But uh, data simulation to work with model developer and the physical parameter developer, uh, dynamical developer as well. We know how to tune the Diffusion, etc. Right. So also you can do parameter estimation, of course. But I believe it has to go in cycle. So the physical parameterization do something, go back to data estimation. Data they do something, feed back to you. And the physical parameterization guy has to run the data estimation to to look at, hey, if I change this this parameter, what what happens next? Things like that. I think it's important. However, I don't think we have the infrastructure to do that, or or even the culture to do it. But I certainly share the same idea you have. But uh, it takes a lot of work, and, uh, and, 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 and most of the things, they, they don't worry about it. It's detailed, okay. So, yeah, we can talk about it. <laughs> Good question. Uh, yes, yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm ready to buy your car. No, I mean your model. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, anyway, uh, now we have seen your uh, dedication and passion for the last 20 years or so that uh, I have known you, and congratulations. I think that, uh, but one thing that at the end you realize that ultimately where you can uh, win the war is in actual forecasting, right? I mean, that's, that was the ultimate test. You can keep going, right? Do you see the possibility that someday, uh, the system which is being used operationally every day by NSEP 
is also the system that you at GFDL can be using for developing further because this is not the end. I mean, the, the, the war is continuous. It's not just over. Just uh, if you just get the anomaly correlation at the European Center. So what is the, what do you see the long-term potential for this? Because that's the purpose of unified. It doesn't mean the same model for weather and climate. We just cannot use this for climate uh, protection, right? So, uh, but uh, that's why I say this R2O to R cycle, research to operation, and uh, uh, the best way I can put it is uh, right now we are uh, developing the high resolution, high end of the high resolution, very high end of high resolution climate model today. That can be used immediately for NWP. But today, that configuration is we cannot afford the climate simulation, right? But you can do that as a process study and things like that. But in the future, say five years, once the NRP model is very mature, it's possible to use. I just want to ask you that that version, that is, you said it can be used for NWP. Yeah. Will it be used? I'm asking you. Do you think? What is the potential for that to happen? The potential is there because right now there's a new climate law. <laughs> that um, allowed it to happen. So, that's what we need. That's what we need. That's what we need. Yeah. One particular reason led you to um, choose the cube sphere uh, as opposed to a costahedral grid, for example. Yeah. Um, that's a good question, and uh, we thought about it for, for a period of about 10 years. I probably not, not, not extensively, but we did try different grids. So in the, in the late 90s, uh, I actually have a person, a postdoc of something. is an extended postdoc working for more than four years, five years, working on like a size three uh, variation. But I come to, uh, very quickly come to the conclusion that today's methodology we knew, which has developed, or anybody has developed, is not good, not for the good. The good by itself, you ignore anything else, and it's a thing of a beauty, right? It's very symmetrical. And the happen in nature as well, carbon, C60. There's some uh, people who got a chemistry uh, Nobel Prize. But we discovered the Akasahiba grid structure in nature. It is happening in nature. But uh, the numerical organization tends tend to be, uh, you want it to be along one single knife or very far because you want to expand your stencil so you can get high order accuracy. So, low order accuracy organization, your domain of influence, so you are describing in a tiny point. The farther away you go, actually means your organism has higher accuracy. And this is a lot easier to do in Lebanon grid, in Kipsia grid, not in Akasaiva grid. I mean current knowledge. Current understanding doesn't matter if it's CFD or, or Omnijolio or some other. If you look at a stamp of a compass, people have realized you can separate the global model in two groups. It is a cube sphere and a cathedral grid. And uh, there's a huge separation between cube sphere grid and a cathedral grid. The cube sphere grid tends to be more accurate, given the standards of the Why? Because the organism is a lot easier to code. We take advantage of existing knowledge. So for me, transforming from latitude longitude grid to cube sphere is not as hard. Transforming, we have seen several attempts in the past 10 to 20 years. You can come up with something that may look good, but when you put up some real metric side by side comparison, they don't look good. That's a sad truth. But uh, controversial statement, I know people working on Agadol will be a uh, you will be yelling at me, but <laughs> show me the other side before you yell. <laughs> Do you have any other questions? Heather, 
Can you hear? Hi, yeah, we do have a question. Um, let me see if okay. I can unmute. Uh, from Luku to Tawari. Um, I'm having trouble unmuting, actually. So he asked his question in the chat, and it was, uh, do you know a specific reason of superior performance of FB3 over MPAS? Maybe we should a computational scientific. Just as a specific Maybe. reason, I guess an overarching reason. And okay, uh, you want me, uh, are you asking a computational no, performance? Scientific. scientific reason, yeah. Scientific reason. Um, I, I, I think that uh, um, the integrity of the numerical algorithm, for example, I, I shown something like this, and uh, how do you, for example, just this a simple uh, case shown on the screen here, how do you deal with problem following coordinate? That's just the numerical reason. You have to have a better algorithm instead of just treating it as a uh, they, they took a governing equation and used to terrain foreign coordinate transformation, and now you have two terms, right? And those terrain foreign coordinates give you two terms with opposite sign. That's a well-known problem. And people just take a finite difference and decriticize it and, and, and think they solve the problem. But it's more than that. So there's lots of uh, 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 reasoning, physical reasoning, and how do you build the numerical algorithm to maintain physical consistency. So it is not a single uh, place that I can tell you that uh, uh, why this is, why this call is better than the other call, but I think there are multiple reasons, and I can go give you uh, a few. For example, the aversion uh, scheme in every three will be much more accurate and then pass. That's guaranteed. If the people are listening, they do not believe. I'm welcome to, to a test. Comparison as well because there wasn't tested. I knew it's much much more accurate. Um, uh, people don't want to compare, it, but uh, also it's not just the accuracy; it's also the uh, computational efficiency that I didn't uh, get to explain. It, it, it takes a, a little bit long to to explain. So I, I I'm not sure. Maybe if, if you can ask me a very specific uh, point, then I can answer the point. Thanks, SJ. Okay, but uh, it to be more specific because it's just general. I, I, I don't know where to go to. Yeah. Not a single answer, actually. Not a simple answer, but uh, not for many places. But I would say we stick to the physical principle better than others. That might be the simple answer I can give. Thank you. Yeah, are there any more questions, Heather? Uh, nothing else has come in. I don't think there are any questions from anyone in the room. Thanks very much, yeah. Lori and Jim and SJ okay. for, for letting us do this. Thank you, Tom. Um, great. All right, well, uh, thanks, Heather. We're glad everybody could join in. Okay, thank you, everybody.